for my students. If you go over here and you learn something, just come back and teach me what you learned. That way we can share it with each other. Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 686, with today's guest, Kyoshi CJ Mayo. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, the founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do, well, it's to support traditional martial artists. What does that mean, Jeremy? Well, if you want to know what it means, go to whistlekick.com because we don't have time in this intro for me to tell you all the stuff that we do. I will tell you that at whistlekick.com, you'll find a store where we have everything from apparel to training programs to protective equipment, and you can save 15% on the stuff over there with the code PODCAST15. The show gets its own website. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go for that to check out all the show notes and transcripts and videos and links and all the good stuff that we drop over there for each and every episode. Yeah, two a week. Is this episode worth 63 cents to you? If it is, consider supporting our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick at $5 a month. $5 a month, a little too rich for your blood? You could do $2 a month. Heck, you could do two fifty. whatever you want. We will accept it and thank you and be very grateful. You could also, you know, check out whistlekick.com slash family for the entire list of the things that we offer up for you to do to help us. Offer up isn't really the right word, but we'll run with it. There are a bunch of things you can do to help us in our mission. And we even throw some exclusive bonus content over there, kind of like a mini Patreon, and it's free. Update it once a week. Check it out. Today's guest is connected to some people that I really love dearly. And I've heard some good things, and I was thankful that I finally had the chance to get to talk to him. I feel like Kyoshi Mayo and I are very similar people, similar in age, similar experiences, and very similar attitudes towards the martial arts and training today. And that made for a wonderful conversation. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And here we go. How are you? I'm good, sir. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Thanks for doing this on on kind of short notice. No worries. I'm glad to help. Yeah. Well, you know, that's one of the, the nice things about what we've been doing for the last few years is, you know, we've 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 built up some uh, some credibility and some capital with some folks. So when we say, "Hey, help," people say, "Okay." Right. Kind of nice. Yeah. Absolutely. How'd the interview go before me? <laughs> Uh, you can just say good, different, yeah, crazy. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was not crazy. That's good. It was the opposite of that. It was, well, that's good. it was, yeah, it was just a great conversation. That's good. That's good. A long time ago, I've never met him in person, but a long time ago, uh, we had chatted back and forth because he lived in Seattle for a little bit. Mm. I was going to go up and visit him once, and it just never panned out oh bummer yeah so no interesting interesting man smart man for sure well a lot of, uh, lot of controversy for sure <laughs> ooh, yeah yeah uh you know this this is going to come out after so people are probably going to if, if you're okay with us just kind of rolling from the moment you jumped on and we had your audio there's some folks who are going to hear this and go oh i know what you're talking about that's, that's, that's your choice. Okay. Well, if, you, if you're okay with that, because I think conversations go better than when we have a quote unquote formal start. So what I will say to the audience is that the reason CJ knows about this is because we, we bumped him. You know, we True. moved things around to accommodate last week's guest. At, th- at this point, it's last week on the agenda. It may move around. Andrew and I are in conversation right now about that about where to put it but you know we've we don't usually have to move things around usually things are just kind of as they are but that's uh pretty important principles martial artists isn't it to be flexible and adapt to what's presented to you so yeah well i'm glad we get the chance to chat been looking forward to this and let's, you know, let's let's do. This. What happened? Did, did was that me? Or, was that me or you? I think it was me. 
I don't know. I was sitting here talking to you and all of a sudden there was nothing. <sighs> Crazy. Well, it, it's, it's still going. So I don't know. I think that was me. Well, fingers crossed that that doesn't happen again. I'm <sighs> my computer is ready. It's ready to be replaced. That's frustrating, but it has to happen. <laughs> yes. No out there. Do we have snow? Oh, we always have snow. It snows no, here. We at my... blame it on the snow. What's... Yeah. <laughs> if we blamed everything on the snow, then nothing would happen. <laughs> it... I, I have a plow truck go by my house every day. Like literally every oh, wow. day. Yeah. There's just, it's just constant. It's either icy or snow on the ground or something. They're just, they're either plowing snow or dropping sand. Crazy. Yeah. My, uh, my wife is from the Pittsburgh area. And so her sister and dad live out there and, there's snow there when we have 60 degree weather you're in the pacific northwest right i am i'm in just south of seattle okay yeah but it rains all the time there right it, it rains a lot more than what i would like to admit <laughs> when i was when i was at the art house at, north, at fort bragg in north carolina and there's guys that would be like, it rains all the time. And I was like, it really doesn't rain that much. And then I moved back here and I was like, man, it rains all the time. I'm trying to remember who's the comedian that does a bit about fear, fear of the sun coming out because it dries out. Oh, it's Bill Cosby. It's a very old Bill Cosby, but that, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, people are afraid of the sun because, you know, they see it so infrequently and it'll dry out your sinuses. And, you know, it's, it's we get like four, maybe four good months a year where it's sunny, not rainy mm. all the time. And it's weird because when the sun first starts coming out, people forget how to drive. <laughs> and then when it starts raining again, people forget how to drive. And then heaven forbid we get an inch and a half of snow around here. The world shuts they down. They forget how to drive in the sun. So, yeah. Oh, that's a riot. It's, yeah. It's, it's like you have to great you're driving on your seasons apparently around here well we we do that here every year the first snow doesn't matter how little it is people are driving you know 40 miles an hour on the highway yeah normally it doesn't normally it doesn't snow here like we don't very rarely will we have like a white christmas mm. and we had the week before or two weeks before christmas it snowed something like that and it snowed pretty good. I mean, I had eight inches out of my house. So wow. that's a lot for, where, a lot I, for where I live. And I mean, normally in a year, I'll get maybe four inches. Mm. So it was a lot for that time frame. And everything shut down. I mean, like I believe grocery it. stores were like, hey, we're shutting down at 4 p.m. today. So get in early. You know, it was it was crazy. You, it what it is. you mentioned time, at which... Where were you stationed? I was stationed at Fort Bragg. Okay. Where we were okay you, did say, you, did say, you did say Bragg. Yeah. Your martial arts goes back before that, though. Yep. I started martial arts at three years old. Oh, okay. Well, you're one of the rare people who started before me. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, I was a bad kid. My parents got divorced when I was one and a half, two, something like that. Mm. And... I did not like my mom at all. Um, I don't remember this, obviously, because it's too far away, but yeah. everyone, my grandparents, everybody, um, they've told me all growing up that I used to kick holes in her wall. I used to spit at her if I'd see her. Uh, um, I used to hit, like, try to smack her. Wow. I was good for my dad. I was good for my dad, but I wasn't good for her once they divorced and once they split. So um, my parents... As far as I know, because there's a lot I don't remember, but as far as I know, they they co-parented very well. Mm -hmm. My dad had custody of us, but they still, of my sister and I, but they still co-parented for the most part. And uh, they agreed to put me in martial arts. Well, there was a guy that my grandfather was in Vietnam with who taught martial arts. And somehow my grandpa got convinced him to just teach me a little bit and try to instill some discipline in me. And uh, it worked for about a year, year and a half with him. And then I think it was just too much, me being too little. So then I went to a different school and started there. But So that was the start of my martial arts journey. It's not uncommon for children of divorce, certainly, to, to prefer one parent over another. But I've never heard of it happening that early. 
Yep. And it was weird because I don't know which parent it was that thought about it. I don't know uh, if it was my grandfather knowing this guy that they were in Vietnam together and just knowing each other. Um, I don't know what the conversation was because I was too little, but they decided to try to put, give me some discipline and put me in martial arts to see if it was an outlet because I was apparently angry all the time. Mm. So, and it worked. It did. It did. It was something that, you know, I don't know if this is your experience or not, but for me, I've had the experience of teaching kids and being around a lot of other people who have, you know, gone three or four years and then quit. Yeah. Or, you know, one of my best friends, him and I met through the martial arts and he's a natural athlete and he just stopped one day. Just, I'm done. I don't, I don't want to do it no more. And was super talented. Um, but just was done with it. And for me, it wasn't something that came, it was, it came natural, but it didn't come natural. If that makes sense. Like I had to work at it. And for me, I think because I had to work at it so much, I appreciated it more. Um, and that makes sense. my son, I have a, I have a two kids. I have two boys. I have a 16 year old and a six year old. Um, my 16 year old is a natural athlete. He just gets it. It picks it up, does it good. And it bugs me because he will not practice something for like a month. And then I'll be like, Hey, can you just show me this? And he'll pop it out. Like, like he was been practicing it forever. Yeah. And it just, it bugs me so bad. I get on this case <laughs> all the time and he's like, dad, I'm okay. I got it. Hold on. Let me. And then when there is something he forgets, I, Oh, that's like my time to be like, I told you to practice, but he doesn't listen to me. Um, does that, does that approach apply to other things for him? You know, is that he take his schoolwork like that? And so certain subjects he does, if he's good at a subject in school, it's the same thing. If he's not so good at a subject, he will study and, and work at it. So like he struggles in math, which my wife was not a math person either. But um, he he will work at math and stuff like that. My my oldest son's got a um, a virus when he was born called congenital CMV, cytomyalgia virus. I forget exactly mm. how to pronounce it. But he is deaf. Um, and he's got bilateral or cochlear implants. Okay. So he's got processors to help him hear and stuff. But, and I'm not, I, I'm going to screw this up. And if my wife listens to this, she's going to be mad at me. Um, okay. But essentially, he had frontal lobe brain bleeds when he was younger. Mm -hmm. And so some things come easy to him and some things don't. And then his brain has is like, I don't know how to really medically term this, but it's like rewired. like to route to understand things and to grasp things. So he uh his journey through school with through or to grow and be where he's at. He's at age appropriate school and everything else now, but um there's a lot of therapies leading up to that that my wife mm. is a, a just an amazing individual to help him through all of that. Um she's got patience for days. Um, so it's, it's very, it's very much a c cool thing to watch him excel at something, whether it be his martial arts, whether it be at school's work, whether it be other sports or whatever it is, it's just really cool to see him excel at that stuff because there's a lot of people with the same type of C congenital CMB that he has that don't get to do that stuff. Mm. So it's really cool. No, I, I can imagine, regardless of, of loving a child, regardless of expectation, preparation, strength of the family, that what you're describing, especially in the early days, was probably very challenging. And one, oh, of, my, one of my recurring beliefs, no, nobody's, nobody's blown up this theory or, or been an outlier on this, at least yet. Uh, I believe strongly that martial artists have a deeper toolkit for coping with and managing with stress, crisis, 
difficulties in life, et cetera. You know, I, I don't want to pick a label for how you might term this circumstance. I think you're right. Um, can, can you, can you talk about what that was like and yeah. how your martial arts played a role? So for him, well, for me, let's start with me. For me, you know, I don't have the, of any of the physical or um, internal stresses or fresh or medical issues that my son has. But for me, it was a very big, you're right, the toolbox of learning how to meditate and learning how to take a breath and relax and, you know, just the problem solving aspect of it, you know, helped me throughout my life. Um, but for my son, he started his training consistently at about seven years old. Hmm. Um, and he, okay. Every white belt or every new martial artist that I've ever taught at least is so awkward looking when they start. They, you know, the, the, the fundamentals, the movements, the smoothness of your techniques and stuff just isn't there. They're still learning. Yeah. But for him, it was even more so because he was still, like I said, he has mixed muscle tones. He has, um, you know, just a lot of stuff going on. So for him to learn how to do this stuff just took a little bit longer. Um, and, but being able to, work on this stuff and get the motor skills down and get the, it helped him. Now he plays soccer, you know, in the high school level, he, he does, you know, a bunch of different athletic basketball, stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that he can do now that I think martial arts taught, helped him grasp like the motor skills, you know, how to, your arm and leg landing at the same time, you know, when you're blocking and stepping into a stance or whatever it is. Um, I think the motor skills of that stuff just helped him. The repetition of that just helped him and helped his brain connect with the movements of things. I don't know if that makes sense or if that was the answer you were looking for or anything like that, but it, it I think it did help him a lot on just being able to put things together, make the puzzle work, if that makes sense. Yeah. And now, I mean, like I said, he's he just turned 16 on New Year's Day, and he is uh, he's excelling in his life, you know. One of he's a good kid. Wow. You know, we so have, starting it. Go ahead. Keep going. We have we have a mutual friend, me and you, Jenny and Gabe Seal, and we do. Uh, they. Uh, I love when they get to work with my my oldest son. His name's Caden, but I love when they get to work with him and see him and and talk to him and stuff because they are some of the kindest people. And whenever they yeah. get together, they they all get to talk and just share experiences and stuff like that. So it's really cool. Nice. Starting at three gives you plenty of opportunities to just stop. Like you talked about others, mm -hmm. just stop, but you didn't, or, or maybe you did and you came back, but if nothing else, I think it's fair to say that you are currently training because you're on the show and don't think I know anybody who'd want to come on the show if they didn't want to train. Right. So the question is why? You know, this thing that you started doing back before, I mean, you probably don't remember your first class. This thing that's been part of your life for at least a huge portion from the very beginning, you've continued in martial arts. You had a point in time where it wasn't your choice. It is currently your choice, and you choose to train. Why? So to, to start that of why did I not stop or anything else, there was a time frame, I think I was like 11, maybe 12, where I was playing football, basketball, baseball, um, 
And I did stop. I stopped for about two months. And I know that's not that big of a deal. I get it. But at the time, I never thought I'd go back. Um, but I realized I was missing something during that time frame. And my dad was never one to push me to do any sport, to do any activity or anything else. If I wanted to do it, he would support me. If I didn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't make me do it. Um, but I, I got to a, a spot. I got to a spot where, um, it became a normal thing for me. It became an, a normal part of my life. And it was just routine for me where the classes were different. I was learning something new and everything, but if I wasn't going to class, then I felt like I was missing something. Like my day wasn't complete. And so I went back and I continued training and I just kept going. What keeps me going now is the, is watching my students accomplish their goals. Um, I love training. I love getting in a room with martial artists. I love being able to do seminars. I think seminars, especially from not only the same art, but different arts are the most amazing mm. things ever because there's always something you can learn from somebody. And if you just have an open mind to it and I love doing that and then taking it back to my students. Um, one of my instructors back in the day, I would do competitions and we were not allowed to talk to students from other schools. Their, our instructors would all talk, but we weren't allowed to talk. And when that was going on, I was wondering why. And so now that I'm older and I've talked to some of those people that I used to compete against and they have schools and we've all talked and we're all friends, they were all scared that we were going to leave each other's schools and go to another school is what the instructors were scared of. Yeah. And now um, one of the guys that I used to compete with, he has a school. Uh, it's weird because my dojo is closer to his house and his dojo is closer to my house. But <laughs> we, That's funny. our students do things together. We go to their school, they come to ours, we do, we do things together. And we were talking and we're like, listen, for my students, if you go over here and you learn something, just come back and teach me what you learned. That way we can share it with each other. And that's something I think that was missing when I was younger in the martial arts. Mm -hmm. And so now when I see that, the accomplishment of my students is what keeps me going. I love the training aspect. Like I said, I like, I like being able to learn something new. But the smile on my students' faces when they accomplish their goals, the excitement that they have. You know, I have a student right now, he's getting ready to test for his black his showdown, his first degree black belt in February next month. And he is 62, oh, that's I think awesome. it is. And his wife was telling me, he's been training with me for about seven years. And his wife was telling me that he has never, she has never seen him um, work at something like this. He joined originally to do an activity with his son. And now he has made it his own. And that's what I like. I like seeing the accomplishment of others. You know, I think, I think for any kid and me, I'm no exception. It was, I want to do what I have to do to get my next belt. I want to do what I have to do to get my next belt. And I have come to the place now where for me, it doesn't matter. But if my students need to see that recognition that they've accomplished a goal, then I want to help them get there. And that's why I still do what I do. I, I love it. I love, I like going to tournaments. Um, I like seeing the accomplishment of tournaments. I like seeing the accomplishment of trainings. I, it's just, it's something that I enjoy get, of helping people reach goals. So you, t you talked about your youth and, and not being able to cross train the, the fear that the instructors around you had about it. What do you think would be different in who you are, if anything, as a martial artist now, if you'd had those opportunities as a kid? I don't know if anything would have been different on my training. I, 
and this is, I don't know how to explain this, but I am loyal to my instructors. Unless they've mm-hmm. done something to lose that trust and lose that loyalty. But I, I don't think that the, I would have changed. What would have changed is I would have been able to have conversations of different training tips to help me improve my, my skills, my art. Um, I never would have left the dojo that I was going to was perfect location for me. It was the right system at the, at the time, everything else. So I don't think it would have changed where I trained or anything like that. It would have changed the conversations that I had and the maybe, you know, training tips, like the gentleman I was mentioning earlier that we have schools near each other. He's a, a different Japanese style martial artist than I am. And he is extremely good at, at fighting. That is one of the, at sparring. He, that is one of his, he's amazing at it. He's one of the best instructors for it and everything. And then I liked forms and weapons more. I'm not saying we didn't cross in both because I had to do all of it, but I just, mm-hmm. I liked I like learning the application behind it, how it applies to to things and stuff like that. And his instructor never taught him that stuff. His instructor was very much a fighter. My instructor was very much a application. This is how we're going to do this, stuff like that. So now when we get together, we teach each other the opposite. And I, and so those type of training tips would have helped me when I was younger compared to, having to relearn all that stuff now. You mentioned that you were stationed in Fort Bragg. And if I remember correctly, that was a, that's an army base. Okay. So you, yes, you went is. into the army yep. at some point after high school, presumably close to right after high school. Right after okay. high school. Yeah. And I'm always fascinated yep. with people who have a long time training, you know, we're talking 15 ish years. And then they step into the military where they have their own, philosophy on combatives was that challenging for you yeah yeah it's really challenging um in fact i had a drill sergeant when i was in in osit in basic and stuff who he was the king of combatives for Mm -hmm. the drill sergeants and he was challenging people left and right and there was so many holes in his tactics early and, and, and i don't mean that disrespectfully but there's things that because i trained for so long that i could see that he could counter what yeah. he was doing and i learned it very quickly in basic you don't show up a drill sergeant <laughs> did you so, learn that the hard way <laughs> oh i, I want to hear this story <laughs> uh, so well it actually has to do with combatives is they were showing some combative moves and the drill sergeants, you know, they show it on each other and then you have a partner and you're working on it and stuff. And they were doing it and I was doing the counters the way that I would do them compared to the way the drill sergeant showed us to do it. And the drill sergeant came over and he's like, I told you to do this, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yes, drill sergeant, but this is more effective. And I believe this is more effective. And he said, well, show me. And so when the drill sergeant did it, I did it my way and I ended up hitting him in the face on accident. <laughs> and I proceeded to do push ups until my arms fell off. So after that, that was on day one. That was day so one. After that I learned oh. that I was of, oh. of combatives. So so after that I learned that I will not say one word and I'll do it exactly the way that they show it and everything else. I just I didn't need to do more push-ups. My arms already hurt. So, and it's one of those things where you're basic. If one person does push-ups, everybody does push-ups. And so that night, going back to the to the barracks was very uncomfortable for the looks I was getting from everybody. Wow. So 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 was not I was not a team player. No, at that no, and I, I would imagine that this was fairly early through basic. You know, probably not day one, but certainly not you know the last week yeah no it was like 
a little before midweek point, okay. midway point. Yeah. At some point through that, you know, as, as you resign yourself to say, you know what, I'm just going to do it their way in, in your willingness to do that. You probably opened your mind at least a little bit. And I, was there anything you found that you're like, you know what, this, this is kind of neat. I like this part of this, or this over here was kind of cool that you, you brought back and made your own. Yeah. I mean, they do, there, there are some things in the combatives manual and stuff like that. that they did, But when I went through, they didn't have the army combatives program like they do now. They didn't have that until towards the end of mm-hmm. my time in the military. Um, and learning that actually applied a lot more because it was more of a, and people who are study army combatives are going to hate me for saying this, but it's like a cross between your stand up fighting and your ground game. You know, it's what happens in between those two and stuff like that. Um, and they have jujitsu tournaments and they have stuff like that, or they call them combatives, but they're very similar to BJJ Mm -hmm. tournaments. But those helped me come back because I was not a BJJ guy before, but it helped me make the parallel between what happens from my stand up to, you know, mm-hmm. the ground. So that did help a lot. And now when I'm working with my students, I make sure that we discuss the transition stuff and what, not, what happens if this happens and stuff like that. Interesting. Now, one of the things that I've noticed in a lot of martial arts circles that are in, that are thinking of things in terms of ranges, right? Like you didn't use that word, but it sounds like that's kind of where your mind is going. You know, the transitions between kicking and punching and wrestling and grappling, D- different philosophies approach them differently, but you know, we're probably on more or less the same page. Right. One of the other elements that comes through in military training is firearms. Absolutely. Did you grow up with guns? I did. My dad and my grandfather were all hunters. My grandfather, before he passed away, was a gun collector. Um, So yeah, I I was I grew up around though with around firearms and everything else. So that was not new to me. I'm going to guess that before the military, because I if if we're roughly the same age, right? I'm 42. Yeah, we're, okay. we're around about. When I was coming up, guns were a separate subject. Yes. I'm guessing the military had at least some elements in the combatives instruction you received that at least blurred the lines. Oh, absolutely. Did you bring any of that back? When you teach your students now, when you're talking about self-defense, are you talking about firearms in a dramatically different way than you were raised? Yes and no. Um we we do discuss and i don't know i don't know how to word this okay. um we discuss what to do if you are approached with that but i tell people all the time if someone points a gun at you and they say they're going to shoot you give them your wallet that's replaceable you're not and everything and then they're like well what happens if what if i can do this well okay let's we can discuss this but um but the the i do discuss like kind of what the army has gone through and shown me and stuff like that when it comes to you know close range with firearms close range and stuff like that you know but i i try to stay away from firearm self defense or firearm stuff we talk about the awareness of it and everything but i try to stay away from it because i just <sighs> I know this is, people are going to argue this. Oh, yes, you can. But I really believe that if someone's pointing a, a firearm at you and they're saying they're going to shoot you unless you give them your watch or whatever it is, just give it to them. Risk you versus know? reward. And yeah, like, I mean, it would be really cool if you did a, some sort of strike and knocked the gun out of their hand or whatever. But what happens if you miss? And I don't want to be responsible for them missing or have that feeling like I didn't train them properly for that situation. So it's, it's a very, and maybe it's because I was raised around firearms my entire life and I just, I feel a certain way, but 
I just, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't like being in the middle of that conversation. And I've got friends of mine who they are a hundred percent. You can definitely do this. Yes, you probably can, but I'm sure anybody knows that has been in a situation that's been kind of hairy in their life. Adrenaline sometimes takes over. Um, sometimes your brain freezes, you know, um, I, I've spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan and I've had some of the biggest guys in the world to talk the most crud in the world that when the, the firefight starts happening, they're the mm. ones hiding. And so you don't know how you're going to react unless you've been in those situations. So I don't want to say if this happens, you need to do this because what if their mind doesn't, Life doesn't follow way? a flow chart? Right. So I'll teach it, but I will always use the co- caveat of if someone's holding a firearm to you, give them yeah. what they're asking for. It's replaceable. Yeah. It's, it's such an interesting subject because it gets so polarizing. And what I find fascinating is when people train firearm defense, very rarely are they taking it beyond a piece of wood or a, a rubber, you know, training firearm. You know, there, there are plenty of options. You right. know? Grab a squirt gun, grab a airsoft gun, grab a pellet gun doesn't have to be you know yep an actual firearm with around in the chamber to to test your theories and right absolutely you know it's it's i I look at it the other way or, or i look at it a similar way would i for the what's in my wallet if someone was going to give me that, if I successfully defended against a firearm, where I, would I take that bet? No. It's the exact same thing. You know, it's opportunity cost, if you want to look at it that way. Right. No, absolutely. And that is and that is exactly worth that. You know, the squirt gun and the airsoft is a perfect example of a lot of times when you train with a rubber gun or a plastic one or whatever, you know, this person says bang, you know, and that's supposed to simulate the, the shot, but that's not really accurate. You know, where with a squirt gun or an airsoft, you might get hit and then you'll know if that bang really worked, you know? And more so, importantly, people forget this part. Um, I do some firearms training a little bit. Having that gun go off without ear protection, a couple feet from you, inches from you, if you have not experienced that many, many times, as I'm sure you remember from your army training, most people freeze up. It hits you on a nervous system level. So you don't just have to defend that first shot. You've got to get control of that gun despite what's going on there. And I think for most people, not going to happen. They're going to freeze up. Maybe they, that first round misses them, but if the person with the gun is now panicked. They're going to fire twice. Right. No, yeah, well, absolutely. And that's just, and that's, you, you hit it on the head of, you can do everything right, but that you don't know how the other person's going to react either. There's a, there's a, a very good martial artist in the area here that teaches uh, a self-defense style program. And he tells his students on day one, the most dangerous thing your opponent has is their mind. Yeah. Because you don't know how they can react. You can see a punch coming, you can see a kick coming, but you don't know what's going through their mind. And it's, if you really sit down and think about that, it is completely accurate of you can guess everything. That doesn't mean you're right on your (laughs) guessing. On Nothing's what they're 100%. Thinking. Right. You know, we, we, especially when it comes to this stuff, I think people like rules and they like statistics and it's like, well, you know, if, if this, then, you know, 87.5% and then this and this, and they try to construct this perfect scenario, this perfect approach to a, a circumstance. And it, it doesn't work that way. Life is complex and murky. And that's why I, I like when martial arts training gets into concepts rather than just if this, then that. 
Right. Nope, I'm with you. So you teach students. Where where did that decision yep. come from? Was that something that you know you assumed was always on your path? So uh, I started teaching at my instructor school um, as an assistant instructor and stuff when I made brown belt and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And then I just always taught. The decision to open my own school was actually my wife's idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I was teaching at my instructor school when I moved back and I was, uh, there, there was a lot of things that weren't good about it. Um, I was just, I wasn't comfortable, feeling comfortable about teaching there. I was, there's a lot of animosity, I guess, cause I was always getting certain students that would want me mm-hmm. to teach them and some of the other instructors yeah. weren't. So, um, my wife said, you know, you've done this long enough. You have the ability to, and the resume to, why don't you go teach on your own, you know, open your own. So that's, you know, we took about a year to really plan everything out and then we did it. And my wife is not a martial artist at all. She will not do martial arts at all. Uh, She, I think she would, if I was not her instructor, um, she has, uh, I don't know. Honestly, I don't. Um, she says it's because she wouldn't want like something happen in class and she'd come home and be mad at me or anything like that. But so I was like, well, why don't you go train with blah, 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 you know, whoever it is. And no, it's okay. It's your thing. It's you and our kids things. So, but I don't know. But she does not, but she, she does support it. And she does, you know, help out, but everything's behind the scenes. Interesting. Interesting. My wife's a photographer um, by trade. And so she does a lot of the pictures that I, oh, that we cool. have and stuff like that. Cool. And if they're bad pictures, she did not take them. <laughs> I promise it would run my cell phone. Is teaching your full-time job? No, it what is else not. Do do? I actually don't. I do not. Uh, so my full-time job is I'm in sales. I, uh, I do sales for um, mechanical insulation. And I kind of fell into place in that. That was not a life goal or anything. I don't think anybody I'm, grows up wanting to be in sales. To be in sales. I've never, but, I've never met a kid um, who was like, yeah, I want to be in sales. Yeah. Yeah, no. I don't. If, if they are, I would like to talk yeah, them out yeah, of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, I, enjoy, I enjoy my job. I enjoy the, the team I work with. So, but, uh, so that's what I do full time. And then I teach in the evenings and then go to tournaments on the weekends and all that other stuff. Nice. Nice. Would you ever teach full time? Is that a goal? Uh, It's not a goal. Um, I would do it if the situation was right. If everything lined up and that's just what needed to happen, I would do it. Um, the gentleman I told you about that I competed against as a kid and stuff, and he has a dojo close to me, he teaches full-time. And so we've weighed the pros and cons against what I do compared to what he does, stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, and there's a lot of cool things that he gets to do because he does it full-time that I don't mm-hmm. get to do. Um, but there's a lot of stresses and headaches that he has that I don't have. Hmm. So I don't, I don't know. It would, I don't know if I would, it's not something that's on my agenda right now to become that, but if everything lined up, it would not be, I would not be yeah, against it's, it. It's an interesting answer. And it's one that I think far more people who start part time would likely echo because there is a dramatic difference between a martial arts school being, I don't mean this word disparagingly, a hobby. Because I think right. the best hobbies are things you enjoy doing that make you some money. And, and I mm-hmm. think for a huge percentage of martial arts instructors, that's what it is. Something they love to do, they share their knowledge, they put a few dollars in their pocket, everybody wins. But the moment it becomes right. full time, 
the way you approach the school has to change because you got to make rent. You don't have that core financial income from sales or being a mechanic or whatever else it is you do. I know so many people who teach and they all have different jobs. We've heard from so many of them on the show. Yeah. You know, I don't know what it's like um, for everybody, but there is a stigma, at least around here, that if you don't teach martial arts full time, you're not a true martial arts instructor. Oh, interesting. I haven't heard that. And and it's and it's not like people outright say it, but the stigma is there. And in conversation, you'll get it in passing and stuff like that. And I was watching a YouTube documentary about um, some instructors in Okinawa, and they all have part-time jobs and stuff like that. And they were discussing why they have it. And they said, because I don't do martial arts to make a living. I do martial arts because I love it. And it's just one of those things that, uh, that just come up, you know, that, um, yeah, that the stigma just is there around here. So it's kind of interesting to, to find the people who believe that and then rebuttal their responses with what you actually live through. Well, here's what I would tell them. You're welcome to send any or all of those people to me. And here's what I will, I will ask them. So as someone who is a, a, a brown belt, someone who's been training for three, four years, who would most would suggest is not qualified to open a school, are they not a martial artist or not, are they not a real martial artist? And of course they'll say, well, sure they are. Okay. So where, where in their progression of rank, if they choose not to teach, do they stop being a martial artist? Well, they, you know, they can be, mar- okay. But being full-time makes them not a martial artist or less of a martial artist. And of course you catch them in that, in the trap and they will try to talk their way out of it and probably just walk away. But I, I, I don't, yeah, I think that's an absolutely ridiculous thing to assert. I think anyone who is engaged in sharing and spreading martial arts is doing a really good thing for the world. Yeah, it, that's, that's a good point, you know, so. <laughs> absolutely. It takes all I mean, kinds. It really does. And some of those kinds are kinds of people that I just don't understand. And that's all right. Yeah. Well, and I think that that goes to a lot of the the schools that, and there's nothing wrong with these schools, but there's there are some schools that are just for money and will charge whatever they can to make sure they get the next dollar. Yeah. So you grew up competing. Sounds like mm-hmm. you bring your students to competitions. Do you compete still? Um, I do not. Um, I competed a couple years ago just because some of my students asked if I would. Mm-hmm. But um, I do not actively compete. Um, like I was saying earlier, there was no, there's no big tournament leagues up here anymore. NBL's gone. There's no NASCA, none of that. So a couple of people around here have started a league. Um, it's called the Kaizen League. And um, I arbitrate those tournaments. Mm-hmm. So I personally don't compete anymore. That makes sense. It's hard to arbitrate if you're also doing it. Yeah. And there's a lot of, I've got um, some metal rods in my foot and plates and stuff like that. So it just makes it a little bit more difficult Ooh. to be as solid as I would like to have it. But Army stuff, solid. martial arts stuff or other? Um, from the military. Okay. Yep. Okay. Does it impact your training? It does. It does. Um, but I don't make it known, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of times where we'll do something on one leg. Well, for example, my toes on my right foot don't touch the ground because oh. the way the plates and the poles are, they lift them up. Well, you can't be really rooted without your toes digging in. So it's harder for me to do some balanced stuff on that side. I can still do it. It just 
takes me a little bit more. Yeah. So. Okay. But I do not compete. I like tournaments. I like going to tournaments. I like watching tournaments. Um, the, I think people learn from tournaments, even if you just go watch, I think you can learn from tournaments. Um, I agree. And I, that's one of the reasons why I encourage, I don't make my students, but I encourage them to go compete, go watch, go either, whether it's a big sport martial arts tournament where it's, whether it's a, you know, little in-house friendship tournament, whether it's a, you know, a World Karate Federation style tournament, you know, USMKF, whatever it is, style tournament. I think you can learn something if you just go and have an open mind of things. Yeah, I agree. Completely agree. So what's coming? What's what's down the pipe? What what are you looking at? You know, over the next whenever, if we if we got back together and. I'll let you decide what the timetable is. And I said, Hey, CJ, what's gone on since we last talked in 2022? What would you hope you were reporting back? Um, I would uh, this. Okay. I would like to report that um, my students have accomplished their goals and have branched out and now are teaching other people. Mm. Um, I would like to report that the tournament league we're a part of has actually grown to be in a a good solid tournament league that competes with the nascas the nbls the i don't even know if nbls around anymore um nascas and stuff like that you know i would like to report that my training has continued and that i have continued to grow as a martial arts a martial artist um, and and be, have become more well-rounded. I think that those are, I don't have major like accomplishment goals except for to continue to improve. And whether learning from my students, you know, learning from other people, just doing stuff like that. I would like to travel to other places to learn things, you know, do seminars in other places not just from the people that I always work with. Okay. I think that's I think that's what my accomplishments would be, my goals would be. How how far out are we from some of your students being ready to step out on their own? Um I've got a couple that could do it within the next two, three years probably. Oh, cool. Maybe maybe one that could do it within the next year, year and a half. Um but, you know, probably the next two, three years, I, I foresee some branching out and some doing things. I know one of my, one of my students has already talked about putting a plan together and stuff like that. So cool. it's definitely in the window. Um, one of the things that I would like to do is to get all of my senior belts, my brown belts and above. And I'd like to go to Okinawa with them. Um, I've been fortunate enough to train in Okinawa for, for a short time. And I would like to send the, to go with them to train there as well, just to see a different culture. Mm. You know, there's, there, to me, there's a different culture in training from the West coast to the East coast of the United States. Um, I have heard that I've done very little training on the West coast, but I've heard that. Well, come on over. <laughs> um, I, I, if, if things go right, that's happening. That's, that's the rumor. <laughs> and then but then also going to other countries you know i trained a little bit in germany when i was over there mm-hmm. and uh stuff like that so i've i've been to different countries to be able to train and i'd like them to see the difference and the different ways of doing things um like i said before i think seminars from different arts are some of the greatest ways to learn your own style um, because they will, it, they intensify what you've already been working on. Yeah. I'm right there with you. Completely agree. If people want to get a hold of you, website or email or social media or anything like that. Yeah. So I've got 
my website. I've got Facebook. Um, I've got, I don't have an Instagram. I don't know how to use all that stuff. Um, <laughs> that's okay. But I've got Facebook, uh, my dojo Facebook page. I've got a dojo website. Um, my dojo's name is Shinzo Kaizen Dojo. Um, loose translation of that is um, improving one's heart, continually improving one's heart. Um, I, I, I believe the martial arts. If you if you're in it for the right reasons, not only the physical, the health aspects of it, but it improves your heart, your soul, you know, it, mm. it, it brings balance to your life. And so, um, but yeah, that's, that's how you get a hold of me. Nice. Awesome. We'll, we'll have that stuff linked at we'll still kick martial arts radio.com. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for hey, talking. To my me. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And before I let you go, because I know, you know, this part, you know, what are your, what are your final words? We've, you, you've given some great stuff today and anybody listening is like, yeah, this is, this is awesome. So how do you want to leave it? What are your final words to the folks listening? So something I tell a lot of my students at the end of my classes is um, be better today than what you were yesterday and be better tomorrow than what you are today. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason that I say that is because I think if we just take a second to learn from each day will be better. The world will be better. And that's, that's something that I would like to see is as not only as martial artists, but as our world that we are just better humans. If you've been listening for a long time, you know that I love my job, whether I'm talking to someone who has a very different opinion of things or a very similar opinion. I pull a lot of value from it. But they lead to very different conversations. When I talk to someone that I don't have a lot in common with, we spend our time looking for that common ground and trying to build on that. But with a guest like Kyoshi Mayo, I didn't have to spend any time building that common ground. And we were able to go deeper. And I was able to learn so much more about him and what makes him tick than I'm able to with most guests. And that, as someone who's done several hundred interviews, is something that I really appreciate. So, Kyoshi, thanks for coming on. And if all goes well, we'll get to meet in person soon. Hey, all of you listening, did you love this episode? Do you appreciate what we do? Maybe you should tell someone about it. Maybe you should share this stuff with your friends. Share it on social media. Share it in an email. Next time you're training and punch somebody in the face and they're like, oh, what's going on? Don't apologize. Just say, hey, do you listen to martial arts radio? (laughs) Heck, you could do it any way you want. I don't care. I just hope that you value what we do enough to support us in some way, whether it's a free way like sharing the episode or it's something like the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick, buying something at whistlekick.com with the code podcast15, like a training program. Don't forget the flexibility program is free. You want to bring me to your school, do a seminar? Let's do it. Email me. Guest suggestions, feedback, email me. What's my email address? Jeremy at whistlekick.com. What's our social media? It's at whistlekick. What's the website for the company? Whistlekick.com. What's the website for the show? Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You noticing a pattern here? We make it easy because it should be. I want to thank you for joining today. I appreciate your time and I appreciate all of your support. So until next time, train hard smile, and have a great day.